Hello and welcome to our presentation on coping with disaster PTSD with an emphasis on vicarious trauma and self-care. My name is Robin Stout Magala and I'll be your host today. I've been working for Freddie Mac for 23 years in loss mitigation and housing outreach and once I retired I'm now consulting as a trainer for the Counselor's Corner. I've been in the industry for over 48 years but I still learn something new every day thanks to you and we hope today's content is beneficial for you. So I'm going to read this disclaimer verbatim. This session is about PTSD, specifically vicarious trauma related to disaster situations. The information related here is from professional sources and is not a substitute for proper medical care. For additional information, please reference the abundant resources at the end of this presentation. And please note that information is subject to change at any time. Now, here's some information to help you view this uh, recorded webinar. You can pause, rewind, and fast forward this recording. Those are the first three arrows at the left. And then the fourth and fifth arrows on the right are for speaker volume and full screen. So if you're viewing this at work, please adjust the sound that is comfortable for you, but not disturbing to those working around you. And just a quick point to make, each person who wants to view this recording should click on the link to register him or herself individually in order to get credit, just like a regular webinar that we do. Now, in the invitation from the Counselor's Corner with the link to this recording are two more links. I hope you didn't miss them. One is to the PDF version of this presentation in which all the links are active, and the other one to the self-assessment spreadsheet, which we're going to talk about later. Now, if you heard about this recorded session through HUD's Listserv, the presentation and self-assessment spreadsheet were also included as links in that announcement. So this webinar is being brought to you by the Counselor's Corner. We're your one-stop resource center. We provide free webinars to expand your knowledge of industry changes, updates. We give you headline news, grant opportunities, and a lot more. In the lower left-hand corner is the website URL. Please bookmark it, uh, visit us often, encourage your coworkers to join as well. Membership is free. Yay, that's a good word today, right? Free. So here's a question for you to think about as we go through this session. And you can see the question here. It is, was your area affected by hurricanes Harvey, Irma, or Maria, the California wildfires, or the Las Vegas mass shooting? Now, even if your answer is no, understand that a natural disaster or civil unrest can happen anywhere at any time. There can be a monster blizzard, flooding, uh, a train carrying poisonous chemicals that derails, earthquakes, a citywide power outage that lasts for weeks, so many things that can negatively affect our everyday lives. So that's why you're viewing and listening to this educational presentation, to learn how to cope with the PTSD that follows different kinds of disasters or civil unrest. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jerry Tart, who will be the presenter today. Jerry, take it away, it's all yours. Thank you, Robin, I so appreciate that. I would um, very much like to tell you a little about myself. I am in um, private practice in the Central Florida area. I am a um, psychologist, a psychotherapist, the terms are sometimes interchangeable. I've been in the arena of counseling for over 41 years. I've worked in various industries to include uh, aerospace and criminal justice and the educational system as well. So I um, just want to say that this particular subject matter is near and dear to my heart. Our uh, objectives today is to give you information that would be of benefit and help you to understand what vicarious and or PTSD can look like to you, to understand the meanings of the word, to identify how um, you may be affected, how you can analyze signs and symptoms when you are possibly dealing with uh, your own clients, and to um, identify effective coping strategies get, and to get resources as well. It is one of those things that can sometimes affect your professional profici proficiency um, and because of the subtleties, subtleties, and because of the subtleties of it, you sometimes don't even realize it. 
disaster is a um, one of those things that can affect how we feel and that feeling can sometimes be so helpless when there are circumstances as Robin has alluded to that has happened in our communities or throughout the areas in the um, last few months there are a number of people who are struggling with um, how to overcome the, that feeling of helplessness. And it's important to understand that sometimes it can be so intense that it's almost paralyzing. So if we understand the what's going on, then we have a better chance of getting back to a place where we can normalize. Vicarious trauma is um, one of those things that affects us in such a way that sometimes it changes our view of the world. Other terms that we'll be talking about is secondary traumatic uh, stress as well as compassion fatigue. And with that, we understand that um, in the helping profession, professions, whether you are a counselor, um, whether you are a physician, whether you are a therapist or a rescue worker or a police officer, because you are face to face with uh, trauma on a regular basis or individuals dealing with trauma, then as a result of that constant connection, you can find yourself in a position where you are trying to deal with it as well. So, the, uh, and also looking at uh, vicarious trauma, it refers to how this can change, as I said before, the view, your view of the world. Sometimes that sense of um, being safe as a result of being in whatever profession you're in can minimize, can be diminished or minimized because you see this occurring, this occurrence over and over and over again. Secondary traumatic stress refers to a set of psychological symptoms and it mimics PTSD or post-traumatic stress and in recognizing it, um, but it acquires, we acquire the thought processes that individuals give us and sometimes we take them on and we can find ourselves in positions where we have not necessarily experienced it, but we, because of our caring concerns of others, we find that we are carrying that heaviness or that stress, if you please. Um, you may also experience a change in your memory and your perception, the, uh, your sense of efficacy in terms of doing your job or whatever. Part of that, it comes from that um, secondary traumatic stress. Um, it depletes your sense of, of self, your sense of safety, as I referred to before. Compassion fatigue are a normal display of stress resulting from your caring for others who may be regularly experiencing and trying to overcome some of the circumstances with which they've contended in the last few months. Okay, understanding vicarious trauma also creates a state of tension within us and we can find ourselves preoccupied. There was a survey done and it indicated that over 89 or 86.9% of emergency response personnel reported symptoms after being exposed regularly with traumatizing events or individuals who have had been included in uh, various traumas. The healthcare professionals struggle with their responses to the, to the traumas and sometimes they suffer as much as the patients. Their mental health, which could be yours as well as the clients with which it is that you contend, is, is um, at stake if it is that you don't pay attention to the emotions and the feelings that you are encountering. Counselors may um, uh, see their clients, you may see them, experience panic attacks, if you've never understood what that was, as a result of trying to assist them, you could find yourself feeling overwhelmed, a sense of um, dizziness, a sense of uh, not understanding what's happening, severe palpitations, and uh, that's a panic attack. So sometimes when the individuals are dealing with, with clients who are struggling with uh, trauma, then they too find themselves experiencing experiencing some of the same things. So understanding secondary is secondary traumatic stress is to recognize that this is an occupational hazard. It has been said that the, you're, the women are more likely to um, be at greater risk and poss possibly part of that is because of that nurturing behavior. It isn't to say that men don't have a 
uh, aren't nurturing, but sometimes you, it is more evident with, with women. So we want to pay attention to how to begin to protect ourselves. And all of this on the front end right now is about getting familiar with the terms. Um, some traumatic professionals believe that they can no longer be of service to their clients. So they end up losing their job, leaving their jobs rather, simply because the impact is just that, can be just that intense. And for, um, however, there are those who have worked in the arena for a while. And as a result of that, they understand certain triggers, their own personal triggers. So as a result of that, they're able to pull back when they're overwhelmed or they're able to maybe um, give themselves permission to do something that's not necessarily as, as stressful after the workday. Maybe they um, become more excited about exercising or um, doing something that is maybe none mind blowing, like watching I Love Lucy or something like that. But the point that I'm going, I, I'm trying to make here is that we become, we, I want you to become more and more aware of the exposure and what long-term exposure of uh, trauma can do to your mindset. With compassionate fatigue, oftentimes because we are so empathetic, we have to do this to connect with our clients. And as a result of that connection, then it, we find ourselves being exposed um, or, uh, to compassionate fatigue because our feelings are so intense in trying to help them through whatever their struggles are. It's imperative that there, our level of awareness is raised because sometimes we tend to think, but when the client is going through whatever it is they're going through, what if I don't show that I'm compassionate? So that would give the client the impression that you don't care. It isn't a matter of you wanting to uh, have your clients to think that you don't care. It's a matter of not only you protecting your clients, but trying to protect yourself. Emotional experiences can present themselves in different ways. Sometimes, particularly when we're dealing with compassionate fatigue, we can become so overwhelmed with the circumstance in and of itself that the person is presenting that we begin to relive whatever it is that your client could possibly be talking about. Therefore, we can become less effective. So the whole point is to recognize that our effectiveness is really important. Our clients need to believe that we know what we're talking about. They need to believe that we're in control. And oftentimes they come in asking and wanting somebody to be able to help them to see clearly what they're, in, what they're dealing with um, while they are going through this particular circumstance of life. And they want you to fix it. And that doesn't work because sometimes we can't fix it. So we don't have all of the answers, but what we do have is a, a knowledge base. And this is what this is about, raising your knowledge base of what this looks like. So when you yourself or your client is dealing with either one of these things, you can give them some information as well as helping them to deal effectively with what they are encountering. So now we have this question and Robin, if you would, do you want to speak to this? Sure. So think about this as we go through the presentation. You can see the question, have you observed PTSD, as Jerry just described it, in a client or in others? Okay. So keep that in mind as we proceed, as Jerry is going to continue to talk about some risk factors now. Okay. Back to you, Jerry. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Robin. So when we look at some of the risk factors that we could sometimes confronted as managers or whether we are just uh, counselors and when I say just I don't mean to minimize because the role that you, the role that you play is critical but in management helping you to understand or one help they want to understand how to help you to be less likely to be at risk so it's important that they uh, give you the kind of support that you're looking for that they understand what some of your concerns are. So it's important that you are willing to go and share with them when you are feeling overwhelmed, when you do need assistance. And you may have been one of those individuals who has been, who has been on the job for a number of years, but when confronted with certain circumstances, as I've said before, when there is a client or clients that's coming in and they are repeating circumstances. Robin said on the, on the front end of, of this presentation, we could have been exposed to all kinds of things, whether it was 
hurricanes, whether it was the fires, whether it was um, shootings, it could be the loss of a loved one with a chronic illness, a long-term illness, and you just weren't ready to let go. That devastation can bring you to a point where you can become so overwhelmed that you aren't as focused as you think that you are. So being able to share, it's imperative that you have clear guidelines. What do I do if I'm in this place I can't work through where I am, but I've got this client who comes in and he or she is demanding that I give them whatever it is that they're asking. How do I work through that and be safe and keep that client safe? So those are some of the things that your supervisors really do need to help you with, but they won't be able to do that if you don't give them the kind of information that they have. Supervisors of counselors at risk should address your challenges, and they will if you share with them in working with trauma. Um, it's important for them to uh, help you to know what is appropriate to work within the guidelines so that they and you can maintain the um, ethics of the job in and of itself. Resources for supervisors to assist counselors in distress is important. It is absolutely important. And the wellness and the essential part for, of the, for the supervisor's success is to help you navigate through dramatic events or to mitigate the probability of becoming um, overwhelmed or becoming a victim, if I can use that term, of developing um, vicarious trauma. Other risk factors have to do with um, recognizing that there are clients who are going to come in, and as I said before, they're going to be demanding. Simply because you're dealing with a client who might be presenting with some kind of trauma does not necessarily mean that their personality is going to change. Individuals who may be aggressive or, or bullies or whatever with outside of a trauma is more likely to be the same way even with, with the trauma, um, maybe even more so. And that looks like their demands, they are not listening to what it is that you're saying. They're going to try to tell you how to do your job because they want you to do it the way that they want you to do it. They are more than likely um, combative. They will um, not be compliant. They will um, oftentimes want more of your time than they are allotted. So be mindful of that. Working with clients who are hostile and threatening, it's important to you for you to recognize that safety first, safety first. If you're confronted with an individual who is demanding and aggressive towards you, then if you're sitting, stand. If you ask them to, to um, stop, and they choose not to stop, ask for help. Please don't put yourself in harm's way. Please don't allow them to, uh, to force you to put them in harm's way, right? There are individuals that don't do very well with stress. Some people believe that when there is a loss of everything or from their perspective, from their perspective, they've lost everything. They may come in talking about suicidal, um, having suicidal thoughts. When there is a suicidal threat, those are the, going back to what I said a moment ago in terms of what it is that supervisors need to know and how they can help you to manage certain conflicts is that when you hear those kinds of things from um, your clients, you aren't in a position to be their therapist or their physician. So share with them that you'll try to get them the assistance that they need, or you see that they are evidently in distress and you want to try to help them as much as you can, but restate the, the, the guidelines that are clearly given to you in, in terms of helping you not to be at risk and to minimize uh, whatever uh, efforts that they are trying to uh, impose upon you. Um, PTSD symptoms can be very intrusive. They can um, cause you to second guess your sense of safety and your trust and your worldview. So I need you to understand that those are one, that's one of the reasons that we're talking about. Why is there a risk factor? What kind of risk factors are we contending with here? Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about some of the symptoms that you might see when you're dealing with um, vicarious trauma, 
secondary traumatic stress, and or compassion fatigue. There are various parts of our humanness, as it were. Every part of us can be affected by PTSD, can be affected by trauma, can be affected by our compassion to assist people. That can range from emotional, our behavior, behavioral uh, processing, our physiological processing cognitively, or our uh, spiritual um, concepts, things that we hold on to. When we look at um, either one of those, one of the first things that oftentimes show when we have been affected by a trauma or by someone who's dealing with the trauma is how it how we deal with it emotionally. If a client comes in and he or she is very emotional, it's not uncommon that it will emote sadness within us or we will feel anxious or we will feel like we are powerless because we can't change a circumstance. If someone is telling you that they've just lost their home or their entire possessions to a flood or a fire, or they've just lost the only child that they have, we are inclined to want to show our fellow man that we care. So emotionally, it's going to affect us. And just imagine you've got five clients on your roster and four of those five clients are going to come in and say basically the same thing as it relates to a loss. By the end of the day, certainly by the end of that first client, depending on how intensely they express their concerns, you're going to feel something. Your uh, behavior will change. You may even begin to feel a sense of despair. You may experience uh, a feeling of general unsafe, unsafety because they've told their story or you've heard a story regarding a traumatic event over and over and over again. So emotionally, you're going to feel some sadness. You might even feel irritability. Um, you may not even want to hear it from another client anymore because you're so full. That's important. It's an important signal of the kind of symptoms that presents themselves with vicarious trauma. Additionally, what will your behavior look like? It is not uncommon that your mood will change. You may find yourself wanting to isolate. You may find yourself feeling very overwhelmed and empty even. And with that, sometimes when we have that, that um, behavior of not feeling connected or whatever, then we want to try to um, feel that void so we could find ourselves eating a little of anything, uh, much of any, uh, eating any kinds of foods that may not necessarily are comfort foods that may not necessarily be the healthiest thing, but they're comfort food. Find ourselves drinking more if it is that you are a drinker. Difficulty in sleeping, um, becoming more inclined to risky behaviors because, again, remember I said before that sense of feeling disconnected from the world or not feeling safe. Out until we can, someone it may require that somebody else will point out that behavior and say, Well, I don't understand. You are, you know, you used to be uh, gregarious and would come in and you're laughing and, and you're happy go lucky or whatever, but the circumstances can dampen that mood and hence your behavior will change. So, um, and the, the difference between a mood, a mood is an emotional state, but an emotion is something that is, um, is, is uh, much more. Um, evident, like you'll cry or you're tearful and then it stops. But a mood, it may be that you feel a sense of depression or you feel a sense of not being able to um, handle that particular circumstance. So you find yourself wanting to separate or you avoid people or you avoid tasks because it can feel so overwhelming. And these kinds of things can really wreak havoc in the workplace because you don't feel connected anymore. Um, one of the other symptoms that could appear with vicarious trauma is physiological. This, this particular dynamic or circumstance is more difficult to recognize. It may be months before you recognize that physiologically you're experiencing post-traumatic stress. Um, 
the, you may find that there are your your body responds to uh, sound or uh, smell or um, a, a sense of, of 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 your sense of being. You may find yourself having headaches all the time or your temperature, and you aren't sick or you don't think that you're sick. It might your hearing may be impaired depending on how you were um, um, how you dealt with the trauma, how the trauma was presented to you. Hypothetically, if a client came in and let's just say they were in a situation and they were still in a highly aroused state, and when they were in with you, they were constantly yelling or they were constantly screaming for whatever period of time, that could impair your hearing. That could could, could create within you um, uh, uh, resistance of some sort of the, of the other. So what I'm trying to say is that, and you may not recognize that that has happened until weeks later when your the volume on your TV is louder than it would have normally been, or the, the volume on your radio in your car is louder than it would have been. Sometimes that is um, it's a subtle it's a subtle state of being, but the body is adjusting or trying to adjust to what you have just gone through and is trying to protect itself. Body memories are another, another type uh, or way of relieving trauma. Um, while far less intense, but it, is, it can still be upsetting. As I said before, when there is a temperature and you say, but I'm not really sick, or there's a memory and sometimes that memory is displaced. You could have been with another person and they said, no, I remember it like this. And you go, no, it was exactly like this. Part of that could possibly be because of how you have related um, to the particular trauma, how you heard it. Um, you're even to the point where sometimes you get skin blotches where the, the skin changes and there, there may be rashes or internally you may find yourself suffering suffering from an ulcer, a heartburn because your body can't and uh, can't digest food properly because you're still trying to allow hormonally your system to work through the trauma a traumatic event or the traumatic information or material that you have had that you've been encountering over a period of time. Your cognition or the cognitive ability to be able to process information can certainly be impaired by um, trauma. Our abilities to remember, to concentrate, to make healthy decisions, our ability to be as positive as we once were can certainly be affected by the trauma. Cynicism uh, has been called the hallmark of compassionate fatigue. Why? Why would one be cynic cynical when they are dealing with some, attempting to deal with someone with a sense of compassion? I submit to you that is that it is a defense mechanism. Sometimes when we can deflect or be um, curt about certain things, then it helps us to try to heal. We don't want to deal with the reality of knowing that you've had a loved one who may have been caught up in a particular circumstance. And in your attempt to normalize that loss, you can find yourself being very uh, insensitive to others who may have experienced the same thing. Now, I know that that sounds counterproductive, but the reality is pay attention to the symptom. That's what I'm trying to say. So as you pay attention to your behavior, and if that is so out of character for you, then you might want to say, wow, I need to check with somebody just to see if I'm as good as I think I am. But if those tools that you find yourself using in the workplace is affecting your relationship, and the proficiency that you may have had before is now being count, uh, um, challenged, then that may truly be a symptom of either secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, or vicarious trauma. And left untreated, it will evolve into post-traumatic stress, okay? What about your spirituality? I know a number of us might hold fast to um, our faith. And as a result of that, we find ourselves um, believing that everything is going to be all right. But what if 
you're in circumstance after circumstance after circumstance. What if not only you have clients who, have, who are going through disastrous circumstances, but you yourself um, were affected. You've lost a loved one. You've lost your home. You've lost um, a precious something that can never be reclaimed. And it mean, me, meant and means so much to you. Something that um, can never be replaced again. Something that um, you believed in fervently or someone, someone that you loved dearly. And you've lost that person or that thing. That sense of... And when we lose that sense of hope, when we don't have that anymore, we begin to question those things that we did believe in, that person that we believed in. When we lose hope, our sense of purpose dec decreases. We sometimes find ourselves, again, feeling disconnected and asking ourselves, why then am I here? How can I ever regain? How can I ever get back? those things that I've lost. It may not be that you will, but what could happen, what will happen, will be that you'll create a new norm. And sometimes adjusting to that new norm can be overwhelming, particularly without our spirituality. So it's imperative, again, when you find that sense of emptiness becoming bigger and bigger, talk to somebody, reach out and, and, and clarify, articulate some of the things that you may find yourself having to um, deal with because it's greater than just that moment. Just to be clear, what I'm trying to say is in an effort to hold on to something that we've once had and that thing is not there anymore, it can affect every part of us, just as I said before. And one of the biggest parts can be our ability to think or focus and to remember what we've held on to to get us from point A to point B. And sometimes, ultimately, that is our spirituality. So with that, I want us to really recognize that these are some symptoms that can really um, uh, cause us to be in a position where we may indeed be experiencing any one of those things that I've just talked about. Robin? Okay, Jerry, thank you very much. So this is the last question in this presentation. You can see it here. So do you think you exhibit any signs of vicarious trauma, SPS or CF? Okay, so we've talked about other people now, what do you think about yourself? So, aha, that's the point of this presentation, to help you so that you can help others, all right? So, Jerry, I'm going to turn it back over to you to continue on about self-care. Okay. Okay. So, as we process through disaster, what does that look like? What does that look like? We talked about what disaster means, how it can sometimes come upon us so fast that we find ourselves reeling. We recognize that we try desperately to um, reassess the, the losses and we try to normalize. We try to get our lives back on track as we've once had it. We recognize that when we are dealing with individuals who have experienced uh, disaster, that the traumatic feelings and the traumatic uh, circumstances that they have dealt with, when they come to us as health professionals, they're going to come and they're going to bring all of that information, all of those feelings, all of those behaviors, all of those doubts, uh, all of those demands. They're going to tell us over and over and over again about their concerns and they're going to want something from us. And sometimes we will become depleted. So rather than to be in that place or find ourselves or when we find ourselves in a depleted state, we have to recognize that we are just as human as 
that client that sits before you. So in terms of how to take care of ourselves, we want to look at what can I do to take care of myself and maintain my job. I don't want to be one of those people who believe that I can no longer, as a professional, handle the things that I do when I'm dealing with individuals who are going through traumas. So I have to take care of myself. Research support, excuse me, that cognitive behavioral strategies, mindfulness based methods are some of the best practices and best methods to prevent and minimize the effects of vicarious trauma, um, secondary traumatic stress, and compassion fatigue. It is widely considered also to be essential for those who are frequently exposed to trauma, okay? And get this, not only the act of that person who's coming to you telling you about the trauma that they've experienced. Even when you when you have to go collect data to support certain circumstances, to get the kind of assistance that you need, sometimes just get, gathering that data, that's, that's another way of being affected by secondary trauma. So it's the material sometimes that you have to collect um, when you are could, could you could possibly be exposed. So that piece is really important to understand. And that's all the more reason that there is a need for appropriate training. That's all the more reason that is imperative that you share with your management or your supervisors what it is that you need. Ask, ask, ask. And if you don't ask, it's going to be difficult for them to assist you. Many mental health professionals who recommend connecting with other professionals who understand the experience of working with trauma. As a therapist, and I said that on the front end, I've been doing private practice for over 18 years. And there are times when I have to go to my coworkers or need to, I need to, um, Downsize. I need to understand how to process this. So help me to understand what it is that I need to do. Because sometimes you just use your tools and you use your tools and you use your tools and you feel used up. So what do you do? Get to yourself. Don't set unrealistic goals. Self-care is imperative for each of us. To thine own self be true. So be kind to yourself. Enhance your awareness of what's going on around you. Okay? Make it a priority for you to understand that one of the reasons that you're looking at this, one of the reasons that you're doing what you're doing is that you are trying to prevent the probability of you taking on so much stress, so much trauma that you're finding yourself dealing with post-traumatic stress. Um, friends and neighbors may not recognize where you are. Friends and neighbors, family members may not, although they may know what you do, or they may be experiencing some things themselves, and particularly if they see you as a source of strength, they may want you to take on more of their issues. So it's important to set boundaries, okay? Express, and I said it before when I said articulate, talk, share. Listen to others who are suffering, but then put your boundaries in place. It's okay to say stop. Clarify your boundaries. That part is really, really important. Express what it is that you need. Um, as you try to help yourself understand what are those things that gives you uh, a woosah moment, as it were. What are those things that takes you to a place where you can release some of your stress? Sometimes for some people, it's um, reading a good nonfiction book, I mean, a, a fiction type book. Or for some people, it's to go for a, a long run or a long jog or uh, a drive or just to um, change out uh, some things in your closet or to clean your garage or whatever. But inter self care is important. And this is what we're talking about. And some of the inner things, by that I mean, is recognizing your uniqueness. Recognize your uniqueness. Give yourself permission to say, okay, I would very much like to have a candlelight dinner. And let's just say hypothetically that you live alone. Then okay. Create 
the, the, the uh, ambiance that you want after a long, hard day and you don't want to deal with anybody and you want to listen to some cool jazz or some uh, classical music or some uh, whatever, then do that. Um, the uh, mu uh, music is, is good for the soul. So give yourself permission to say, I need to do this for me. Or maybe I want to take a, a, a day trip and I want to go up to St. Augustine or to go over to... Uh, Seattle, Washington, or whatever, wherever it is that you live, but maybe you want to go to a place that you haven't visited ever or that you've not gone to for a minute. Do that because part of this processing is to take you out of that arena where you have been inundated over and over and over and over and over again with the same kinds of issues and they are so overwhelming. And you might say, okay, Doc, what if I'm in a situation where I can't do any of those things? Got it. I hear what you're saying those things that you can do, celebrate. It may not be any more than let's just say you lost your home and you were able to go back and you found an heirloom that really means something to you. Just celebrate that, hold it, make it a friend. Trust me, that's a part of inner self-care. Let's just say you're in a position where you are intact and you're feeling guilty because you're intact, but so many people that you know aren't, and you really don't know what to do with that emotion. If it's within your, within your power and you have the strength, go out and help a neighbor. Sometimes that's beneficial. But if you aren't, if you aren't, then again, give yourself permission to unplug. And by that, it might mean that you recognize I've got to get to a place where I'm strong enough to be what I want to be for somebody else. That's a part of self-care. You've got to know yourself well enough to know when you can do, when you're at your, your, your wit's end, you've done as much as you can do and you need to pull back. That part is really, really important. So I consider journaling. That's a helpful thing for me. I like to write. Oftentimes I'll write letters to God because I believe that he knows everything anyway. So it's important to me to just kind of purge myself. So I sometimes sit and I just write. That may be something that you would want to do. Read a good book. Another part of, as I said before, in terms of um, inner self-care, meditate, okay? Um, it may just be finding a helpful mantra, something that will that you can say to yourself over and over and over again in this situation where you have dealt with individuals, you try to help them as much as you can, you're trying to work through your own disasters as much as you can because of the losses that you've experienced, then find something that gives you some comfort. A poem, um, as I said before, a mantra, something that you can say over and over again that gives you solace or whatever. If there's an opportunity, if you have an opportunity and you just really need to relax, then take a class, a fun class. That may be something to help. We know that self-care actually makes you more effective and energetic. So when you avoid things that make you feel physically and mentally, when we avoid things that makes us feel physically or mentally um, unwell, then it tends to deplete our confidence and our self-esteem. That's for any of us. It isn't exclusive uh, to any one of us. We are all susceptible to that. Self-care is important for our physical health. It's important to our relationships. Self-care is imperative to our raising our level of cognition, our ability to think straight. And, and sleep is important. And sometimes when we are inundated and overwhelmed, we don't sleep properly nor do we eat properly. So take, take a quick nap. When you, if, if you're in a position and you can, you may not be able to sleep at night, but if at 10 o'clock in the morning you can and you can take a break at work, then go to your car, go to the bathroom, take a five minute break and take a quick nap. Make, it'll, you'll feel refreshed. Um, learn to be mindful and stay connected to uh, individuals who are like-minded. Um, without self-care, our relationships can suffer tremendously. We are uh, ill-tempered, we are ill-mannered, we are oftentimes unkind, and sometimes 
we don't even recognize it and we don't choose to believe it when somebody can tell us that we are acting so out of our norm oh no i'm not because we tend to think oh i've got this i can take care of this situation or whatever again when we deal with trauma it will have its effect now the effect doesn't have to be ptsd if you are aware but i submit to you without a doubt it will have its effects so the more you choose to do to take care of yourself when you're working through a disaster, the greater the probability is that you will not have to be dealing with post-traumatic stress. So please hear me. What about out of self-care? Okay, what do you enjoy eating? Sometimes you may be one of those people who is now going on a plant-based diet, right? In a, in a, in a disaster or having to overcome some um, differences that's definitely out of your norm, Maybe having a, a good ice cream comb or good piece of whatever it is that you may have enjoyed eating before, just a little piece, maybe just enough to fill that void and get you familiar again with what it feels like to feel good, okay? Uh, do something that may seem a little out of the ordinary for somebody, but it doesn't necessarily seem out of the ordinary for you. So it's important to maintain our confidence. It's important to maintain our sense of esteem. It's important for us to understand how to problem solve when we are working through disasters. So look at ways in which it is that you may have problem solved before the disaster. That ability is still there. It may be suppressed under these circumstances because it seems as if your world is so full of all of the other things that are so imminent that you can't remember some of the problem solving techniques that you may have used before, but they're still there. So that's all the more reason that it's important to try to get out of that, that immediate arena where all of those dynamics, whatever they are, for you. If you were in a position where you can, just do simple things. Let's just say if, if, if one of those things, your clients is coming in and they're still in a shelter and you're trying to help them to, to normalize as much as possible. Uh, you know, if, if they've got a backpack, just say, go through there and look at, look at some of the trash that you may have in there, you know, like wrappers, because sometimes we don't want to be a litter bug and we put everything in our purses or in our backpacks or whatever. Declutter, sometimes just trying to find something to do that creates a sense of normalcy is important. That's one of those out of self-care things that, that you can do. And, and, and if you are one who, again, who's, who's solid and you weren't affected in that regard, but you're feeling the pressures of that, maybe you wanna go clean out your garage or go rearrange your refrigerator or something like that. And that may sound silly, or it may seem as if I'm minimizing, but, but I'm not. What I'm trying to change your concepts at the moment. When we change our thought processes, our emotions change. When our emotions change, our behaviors will change. And that's empirically proven, okay? So that's something that is within your power and you can do that um, easily and it doesn't cost you anything. What about exercise? You know, we always talk about exercise. That part is important. Don't lose sight of it, okay? You ride a bike, go out and do some stretching if the stretchings, if nothing else, uh, stand up and march for 25 minutes or 25 steps or whatever. If you like to play football or, or basketball or golf or whatever, if you have an opportunity, just go do that. If you can go and find a fishing pole of, of some sort or make your own and go and stand over a pier and throw it out there, whether you intend to catch anything or not, but to give yourself permission to change your process of thought. This is an awesome time to go for a long scenic drive, or if you like the rain, to just be in a situation where you can just be outside and, and, and feel it fall on your face or the snow or wherever it is that you are. But those things can make a difference in terms of your taking care of yourself, your out of self care. One of the um, last things in terms of processing through our disaster, if, you have the opportunity to extend a helping hand to your fellow man, then do that. If there is an animal that has lost 
it's um, that has lost its home, or maybe the um, the owner of the pet is hospitalized or whatever, and you can do something to help them, then do that. Extend a helping hand. Spend some time with somebody that may be lonely or scared. Even after the disaster, after your new norm has, you've begun to settle or you've begun to see you, that your clients are settling in, or they've found something, they've gotten a, uh, an opportunity to get some assistance and their homes are being restored or they're in the throes of building a new home or whatever, encourage them not to just necessarily be focused on this urgent issue of trying to um, put everything back in order so quickly. Because believe it or not, sometimes when there is upheaval, there is um, a lesson learned and things that we can pull from that mist of disaster that can be imperative for our living long after the disaster. And it can change our moods, it can change our attitudes, it can help us to extend ourselves in a more loving way towards our fellow man. So give a helping hand when you can. Give somebody um, an opportunity to know the hope that's within you, okay? Robin, I'd like for you to take it now and go through the um, assessments, okay? Okay, Jerry, thank you so much for that wonderful information. Um, I've heard you speak this before and it inspires me every single time. Okay, everyone, so in one of the links in the invitation that you received is to this 20 question self-assessment exercise uh, that any counselor, uh, any other housing professional, uh, that you can take at your leisure, okay? There are 20 questions, and it's designed to give you feedback from colleagues, friends, associates, neighbors, um, who are confronted with like conditions and stress, and or or not. And it's for somebody to objectively say, this is how I see you are, okay? Um, it additionally fosters a support system that could minimize the impact of vicarious trauma. So especially a coworker, somebody who's sitting in the same situation that you're in may be reacting differently. So there are 20 questions altogether. As I said, we attach the self-assessment spreadsheet um, to our invitation with the link to view this session, and it's also included in HUD's listserv announcement. So you have this presentation. We sent it to you uh, with the invitation. So don't try to jot down these 20 questions. You have the spreadsheet, and you have the presentation with all of these questions. So it's a pretty interesting exercise. Um, I hope that you do decide to go through it. The other thing that Jerry did, uh, which is fantastic, is that she came up with 10 frequently asked questions regarding vicarious trauma. Now, there, the next 10 slides are these 10 questions. I'm not going to go through these slides and read them because you have this presentation. You can read everything here. Um, but it's very interesting because, uh, as you know, an FAQ is frequently asked questions. So question number one, two, three, and all the way up to number 10. Very good questions and very good answers uh, from Jerry. So I wanted to remind you that all of that is in the presentation that you got uh, when you signed up to view this recording, okay? Jerry also came up with some fabulous references. These are mostly books. Some of these, as you can see, there are hyperlinks. Um, so that you can go online to read this information. But if you are so inclined, yes, there are uh, books in here uh, that you can read um, to follow up on vicarious trauma and PTSD. Okay, so that's the uh, end of the business part of this presentation. And as we always say at the end of our webinars, what is the housing counselor's responsibility? Well, to take care of themselves first so they can better assist their clients, okay? And that's something a little bit different, a little twist that we're putting on this webinar presentation today. 
Now, I'm not going to go through these either, um, but Jerry mentioned early on that there are lots of resources for you here. Uh, this very first one at the top, you are going to have to copy that link. You can't click on it in the PDF version that you will get, uh, but you can copy this link, put it in your browser, um, and review all of this information at your leisure. Uh, you can see what the headings are here. So if there's something in particular that you're interested in, you can hone in on that particular line and you can click on these resources here. Um, lots of information about workplace stress and working with clients. Information from HUD, um, from other certified financial counselors. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has a lot of information on disasters. And here are some regular resources for you that we usually give you at the end of our webinars that work out very well here as well. Okay? Don't forget your service member clients. Um, they have an opportunity to have different benefits uh, than the regular guy on the street. So it behooves you, if you haven't done it already, add the question to your intake form, are you a service member? Um, or are you National Guard or Reserve? So you don't have to live near a military base to have military clients because every state has National Guard and Reserve. So if you put that question on your intake form, then hopefully you will be able to understand that there are other services available to those particular clients. Okay. Here is everything you need to know about the HUD certification exam. As you know, the final exam is open. Um, all of these links are good. Pay particular attention to the frequently asked questions about the HUD certification exam. Most of the questions you have are answered in that document. Okay. Uh, one last plug for upcoming webinars. Check our Learning Center often for upcoming webinars. Uh, we not only post our webinars, but some really good ones from other companies as well. So sign up for free membership at the Counselor's Corner uh, so that you don't miss these training announcements. Membership, resources, and all of our webinars are free. So once again, I'd like to thank you for viewing this recording, Coping with Disaster, PTSD, about vicarious trauma and self-care. Uh, our very special thanks to Dr. Jerry Tart for bringing us this timely and necessary information. Jerry, anything else you'd like to say before we shut down? I would just like to encourage, as I've said before, each one who's listening to this um, broadcast that you're aware of the fact that you can very easily become trauma doesn't look the same to everybody, but know that you can be affected. And if you choose not to get um, some help, it will manifest itself in PTSD. It will. So please take care of yourselves. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Everyone, remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you're not a member already, please sign up for membership at the Counselor's Corner so you can go to other webinars that we have. So everyone, thank you so much, and have a great day. Bye-bye.